If something goes wrong, it can go wrong quickly and, and very badly. This is Transmission, the podcast of the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. In this podcast, we will uncover the mysteries of diseases that impact us all and delve into the cutting-edge science of keeping people healthy. We invite you to look over the shoulders of the experts who make it their lives' mission to improve global health. In our first episode, we met Professor Jean-Jacques Moyembe, one of the scientists who first discovered Ebola and researched how this infectious disease was being transmitted. In this second episode of Transmission, we delve deeper into the complex riddles pathogens throw on our path and the intriguing research that is being done to stop them. Transmission, your front row seat to the world of health, science and beyond. Lawrence Liesenborgs and Placid Mbala Kingebeni are experts in infectious diseases. They travel the world to unravel the mystery of monkeypox, or mpox as it is officially called. They go far and wide, always on the move. But right now, their 4x4 is stuck in the mud. Yeah, well, the Congolese have a very nice word in French, it's embourbé. The word means when a, when a vehicle gets stuck in the mud, uh, literally, uh, which is one of the most uh, often used words uh, that, that you experience on such a trip. The car is leaning precariously and everyone is trying to get the vehicle back on track. It is 2022. We are in the DRC, short for the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and we are on the road to a remote village in the rainforest. But, as Lawrence explains... Yeah, unfortunately, once you get out of the capital, the roads become really, really bad. And when it rains, everything floods. <laughs> Placida and Lawrence can finally get back in the car. But there is still a long way to go. It's a real hassle to get anywhere. Especially in rainy season, they completely cut off from the outside road and they're completely self-sufficient as well. Lawrence, Placida and the rest of the team are researching an outbreak of Mpox, a disease that starts with small blisters that often spread all over the body. After a while, these blisters become large bumps filled with pus. Over time, they disappear, but they leave large scars and wounds that often inflame. Often they also go to the eyes, so we saw a lot of people with blindness as a consequence of an Mpox infection. In the DRC, between 1 and 10% of Mpox patients die. And this is why Lawrence and his colleagues go to the hotbed of the disease to study it. The disease that we find really in the heart of the rainforest in, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Lawrence and Placide were studying one of the largest outbreaks ever recorded in the country. And getting to the heart of the rainforest was not easy. First, they had to take internal flights. Then they drove two days by car. When that became impossible, they transferred to a motorcycle. And of course, also... Uh, wading through the rivers, and so we were waist high in the water, searching for these Mpox cases. After all those challenges and setbacks, they arrived at the village. Lawrence took time to talk to the villagers, get to know how they live with the disease, and get a better understanding of the whole spectrum of Mpox transmission, from animal to human, and from human to human. We returned to the provincial capital, where finally we had some internet connection. But when they opened their computers... A first case of Mpox has surfaced in Belgium, so the virus has also reached our country. And we have a few questions for Isabel Brosius of the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. You and your team have been researching the Mpox virus. Uh, yeah, that's right. The patient presented himself at the Institute of Tropical Medicine here in Antwerp with symptoms for which the necessary samples were taken to be able to confirm the infection. All of a sudden we found out that there hey, there's already been five cases of Mpox at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. The variant of the virus that spread in Europe was much less dangerous. Still, infectious disease specialist Isabel Brosius found herself at the centre of what was happening in Belgium. I work very closely with, uh, with Lawrence and I normally would have gone together on this um, field trip, uh, but I, I was pregnant at the time, so I, I was forced a bit to observe from the side, but then 
while they were there, I, I mean, how big a coincidence can it be? There's a certain moment where, yeah, we had news via all sorts of scientific networks of cases of MPOX that was suddenly uh, being reported in the UK, some in the US, some in Spain. Um, so already we had the sense like, okay, this is out of the ordinary. Uh, we should start preparing and then only two days afterwards, uh, we had our first case. There was this whole media storm that actually broke loose a bit. And, and at the time, I I was well one of the few people then still at ITM that was actively involved already in, in, in research on the topic. So we, we were completely surprised, of course. Uh, we expected, we, we knew about the epidemic potential uh, ab about this disease, but then going really to the far end of the world to look for MPOX cases, and all of a sudden you come back and there are MPOX cases at your doorstep. So that was quite, uh, quite strange indeed and unexpected. You could start to wonder what drives such a disease. What is the reason a virus like MPOX suddenly appears in a population? It might start with someone eating a sick animal, but why is it transmitted from human to human? What are the important mechanisms? Is it through the respiratory route? Is it uh, because people get into close physical contacts? Is it through uh, contaminating objects like a plate or, or a spoon that is shared or clothes that are shared? to really understand these mechanisms behind uh, the transmission. And because, of course, that will enable us to stop these epidemics. So if we don't map out our answers clearly in advance, before there is a crisis, we will steer blind during the outbreak itself. We would have no idea what measures to take. So it's of the utmost importance to research smaller outbreaks, to collect data about the disease as soon as possible. But as the Ebola outbreak of 2014 made abundantly clear, Researching an outbreak isn't easy. Before we enter the Ebola ward, we pray. This is what Dr. Manjeku tells us before we enter the ward. We put on scrubs, boots, a pair of gloves, foot covers, a full body Tyvek suit, a second pair of gloves, a respirator mask, a second hood, or goggles, a third pair of gloves and a heavy yellow apron. Not a speck of skin will be exposed to the air. After just five minutes, you are saturated in sweat. Walking into an Ebola ward is a strange experience. First time is a bit horrifying. This is Johan von Greensven from ITM. Together with Alex Delamu, who studied at ITM and was doing his PhD in 2014, he was researching Ebola. You see people very sick, dying, bleeding, uh, confused. You, to some extent, have to keep distance. You feel a bit helpless because yeah, also what you can do medically in such a facility, it has changed now. But at that point in time, it was basically about isolating them uh, and giving some fluids. And there was not a lot beyond that that you could do. Situations happened where Ebola patients would start running around and trying to escape and... and yeah. Quite a challenge, and you are overwhelmed. On the other hand... You have to still think very clear. It's very hot, you're sweating, you're dehydrating, but you have to stick to the precautions. You might see someone vomiting, you might wanting to help, but then if the person is confused, pulls your mask, you might actually get exposed yourself. So it's finding a balance between keeping your head cool, but still, yeah, there's still patience. And the only thing those patients see from Johan and Alex is them walking around in some kind of spacesuit. You have to admire the healthcare workers who do this day in and day out. I think that's where most of my respect goes. It's a very high-risk job. And if they get sick, they will just end up with the other patients. They're remarkable people. No matter how complex the situation in such an Ebola ward is, the reason why Johan and Alex are there is simple. They want to better understand the disease, and this is by no means self-evident. An outbreak is always unexpected. Of course, this means that you need to drop everything and, and go there often without funding. Lawrence again. This is one of the reasons why the Institute of Tropical Medicine has set up an outbreak research team, a multidisciplinary group with an anthropologist, a virologist, a clinical scientist, a lab expert, an epidemiologist, and so on. 
They try to be ready to study a disease as soon as there is a new outbreak. Alex Delamu dropped everything. The Ebola outbreak started in my country, Guinea. I decided to go back and help with uh, Ebola control. Johan and the rest of his team wanted to go to Guinea, as well as test a new treatment with plasma from blood of Ebola survivors. But they were not sure and had to decide which action to take. A dramatic outbreak can lead to political unrest. There was already violence. So unpredictable, even the risk for the people involved. Are we up to it? Will we take the risk? Is everyone willing to take it? Eventually, they thought about it for three precious days. We called each other every day over the weekend, and on Monday we decided we will proceed. This time, Johan and Alex arrived in time, but the team had to be quick. Ebola pops up, kills a lot of people, and it is very plausible that the virus will retreat back into the forest before they can get their studies up and running, or before they can get to the remote places where the disease rages. It could be years before Ebola returns to humans, attacks and retreats before it can be studied. And there is another reason the team had to be quick. When an outbreak starts... Well, then everyone yeah, wants to stop the outbreak as, as soon as possible. But that makes research challenging, because once the outbreak is over, there will no longer be people to participate in their studies. Everyone is either cured or deceased. But okay, that's that's part of the game, and, and that's one of the things that makes outbreak research so so difficult. The outbreak research team does not go out there to actually help people or stop a specific outbreak. They are there to research it, to understand how the disease works. This is a bit frowned upon by humanitarian organizations because oh, the, the response, that's what's important in an outbreak. You need to control it, uh, you need to take care of patients, and that's all 100% true, but we think that's also very important to also do research. Research is crucial to learn lessons from outbreaks and in the future support humanitarian organizations and response teams. An outbreak is always so something that is accompanied by uh, panic and also remorse. Uh, most, most of the time we are not prepared for that. It is like a surprise. This is Jean-Jacques Mouyembe the microbiologist and professor who we met in our first episode. You can take uh, the good measures or the, 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 uh, the bad measures. Uh, most of the time it's the bad measures we will take uh, at the beginning. Um, yes. So an outbreak, uh, it is like uh, in a class where we are learning. We are learning during the outbreak to find medicine, to find vaccine, and also to change the behavior. Johan and Alex knew they had to be quick. Reports of the Ebola outbreak were all over the news. There is a fear that the virus will spread rapidly. This is the deadliest outbreak of Ebola on record. Any communicable or infectious disease can go anywhere in the world within 24 hours. Johan didn't know this at the time, but it would eventually become the largest Ebola outbreak ever recorded and would cost the lives of more than 11,000 people. I must say that it was really a shock. Alex again. We quickly realized that the country itself would not be able to respond uh, because of the rapidity uh, of the spread of the outbreak. Uh, it started in one town and then uh, in, four, in four or five months it was already in the capital city which is located about 1,000 kilometers from the place where the first case started. And once Johan and Alex's team had set up, nothing went as planned. They might have mapped out a strategy, but every day they realized their approach was not working as intended or that there was resistance. Problems stacked onto more problems. So it's frightening and, and also yeah, stressful, definitely stressful. There's also very a lot of Pressure also, expectations locally, also politicians or ministries of health, they support you. Uh, they, they want to help the community. They also want to show their community their things are being done. So you have to deliver. But also you are doing it within an epidemic period. So you have to protect yourself and also you have to protect uh, your family and your, uh, your close relatives, you know. So it's like a very, very risky area. So you have to be 100% focused because small mistakes can 
break anything. Or as Lawrence puts it, when he was in the DRC. If something goes wrong, it can go wrong quickly and, and very badly. Evacuation options are limited. One night and there was a, a territorial dispute uh, 20 kilometers from, from the village where we were remaining, so a territorial dispute between two villages. Rumors suddenly started to spread. An attack on the village was imminent. And what was more? In a recent unrest, one soldier was killed and one went missing. The weapons of those soldiers, two AK-47s, were still in circulation. So there were guns in, in the village, and so then all of a sudden things can get tense quite often. Then you had to work as a team. Being able to rely on each other is, is crucially important, and so, so then I was very happy to be there with, with my Congolese friends, uh, which did an amazing job also to, to negotiate. The team got away safely, but it does indicate that outbreak research is not necessarily safe, not for ITM researchers, nor for their local partners. Or as Johan summarizes this Ebola project. I think yeah, the most stressful moment, period of my life, I wouldn't recommend it to my enemy. You live every second, uh, you live for this project. But as a researcher, Alex says... Uh, you have to take a responsibility to do your part of the job. An outbreak research team standing by to jump into action when there is an outbreak is crucial to prepare us for future cases. Because beyond the search for treatments and drivers of the disease, Everyone wants to know where the virus comes from and where it could retreat to once it has run its course. In other words, where does the disease hide when it's not infecting humans? David is 10 years old. He's playing football with his friends. They hear the car before they see it. David forgets about the ball, drops everything and runs to the vehicle. It's a four by four. Some white people get out. Some Congolese as well. He doesn't know they're MPOX researchers, but he has heard some people will arrive in the village today. What are they up to? He keeps on watching them from a safe distance. The Congolese people speak the local language and talk to George, the father of one of his friends. After a while, George points them in the direction of the house of the chief. The visitors enter the building. David keeps on looking, but everything is quiet and nothing seems to be happening. David goes back to his football. Generally, the reception is quite well, but of course, uh, you don't just arrive there. A visit to a village involves a lot of homework. Lawrence and the team of MPOX researchers could upset the whole political and social balance in the village, and that is the last thing they want to do. Always work together and through local organizations. But also with governments or the chief of the village. To make sure that, that, that you are welcome and to make sure and to inform people what the intention is and, and to also listen to what they expect. This is crucially important. And, and that takes a lot of time. Lawrence stays in the village for three weeks. He then returns to Belgium. His Congolese colleagues will stay longer. During those weeks, they will map out how MPOX is transmitted and they will be looking for the animal reservoir of the disease. A virus can only survive if it has a place where it can live happily and undisturbed. It must be able to reside in an animal that doesn't die from the virus itself, because when the animal dies, the virus also dies. MPOX, for example, indiscriminately infects monkeys, rats, mice, squirrels and rabbits. There is a good chance that the virus will withdraw into one of these animals when it's not infecting humans. But it could just as well be an animal that is not yet on our watch list. Once Lawrence and his colleagues know which animal is the reservoir for the virus, they can give advice on how to avoid contact with the animal and greatly diminish the chance for a new outbreak. Sounds deceptively simple, but the search for the reservoir is not obvious. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack, but it's actually mainly by off-the-record research that you cannot do in a questionnaire by really talking to people and knowing their hunting habits, that you understand uh, which species might be the culprit. And so, for example, we have a lot of indications that it's mainly squirrels that transmit the disease. But these hunting habits and these balances are, are quite complex. Once they have an idea of which animal is a contender, the team has to locate the suspect in that endless jungle, catch it 
and take blood samples. There's a lot of guidelines and regulations on this. You cannot just go out and, and catch um, hundreds of bats and kill them off. This is Kevin Arian, virologist at ITM, discussing the challenges of looking for the reservoir of Ebola. This has to be done in the least invasive possible way. Um, with rodents, it's a bit different, but um, nevertheless, I mean, there's never the intention to just kill and slaughter these animals. It's it's catching them, uh, taking a small blood drop, and then releasing them again. The field researchers then send the samples to the lab where the virologist tests the blood to look for the virus. If the animal has the virus without getting sick from it, reservoir found, or at least one of the possible reservoirs. Now researchers can write extra guidelines on how the disease is transmitted and how to avoid contact with the animal. Sounds great, but it remains a big haystack and a small needle. Professor Jean-Jacques Mouyembe is still looking for the reservoir of Ebola, almost 50 years after he first came across the disease. We are studying also the reservoir of the virus of Ebola, but it is very difficult for the moment to have the proof scientific evidence is uh, to isolate the virus from uh, the reservoir. But until now, we process more than uh, 10,000 samples at my institute, but we didn't isolate the, the virus. The challenge is that most of the time, samples aren't collected during the outbreak itself. So it is very difficult to isolate the virus, but we know that the first outbreak of Ebola Sudan, the patients were infected in a cotton factory. And uh, the roof of the factory was plenty with bats. And we also know that the reservoir of the Marburg virus, the cousin of Ebola, is a bat. But until now, we have no confirmation for Ebola. We keep looking, looking for some kind of pattern that can help us. A woman sits under a large and beautiful mango tree. Usually on a little chair, under a big tree. Hopefully it's not going to rain too much. The woman under the tree is Kathy Kreppel, and she's waiting. Kathy is an epidemiologist at ITM. She's here to talk, to talk to people and to find patterns. Kathy loves patterns. She recently found a special pattern that links the rainy season to the plague in Madagascar, and it has something to do with traps and rodents. I already found out that they have certain times when the kids are preparing for the rodent season and making all sorts of elaborate traps. It's a bit like a competition. Who has the best trap? And when rodent season starts, all the children enthusiastically start catching rodents and then they get sick. Knowing that they do that at certain times of the year, to me, indicates that there must be a seasonality. And seasonality is always linked to climate. If Kathy can find the right link between something as large as the seasons and something as small as a rat-catching competition in Madagascar, she will finally understand which factors play a role in spreading the disease. Kathy knows she can't ask people in the village why they start catching rodents at this time of year. For them, it's very, it's totally clear. They're like, well, this is when the rodents are out. But why are the rodents out? She has to find the bigger link herself. Eventually, Kathy realized it had to do with the end of the rainy season. It's when the rain stopped, so you have a lot of rodents because they have just had a lot of food, a lot of grass and a lot of insects and so to eat. But now the rain stopped, so you can start lighting fires and you can strategically set the fires so it pushes the rodents that run away from the fire into your specially prepared traps. But of course, depending on the climate, the rain will take longer or will not come at all or the dry season is very sudden. And all of that has an effect on the start of the trap-making competition and on the timing of the spread of the disease. It also tells you who is at risk of contracting it. It's not the grannies that are sitting at home, it's the kids that are in touch with rodents and catch them and kill them and get scratched and bitten. How do you beat an infectious disease? A good question. You can start with medicines, vaccines or lockdowns. You can take it apart in a lab to understand how it works or look for a treatment. Kathy chooses a different route. She tackles the disease with questionnaires, conversations and big data that link the big picture to the minuscule details. 
and that is why we now see her sitting on a small chair under a large mango tree, waiting for the village elders to tell her stories about how they live. I love being in the communities and just having these aha moments. By talking to the people, she can uncover little details that she would never ever think of on her own and that she can only see when she's in the village. She can then link these little stories to huge data sets, like linking the rats to the rainy season. But she also discovered that the outbreak of the plague in Madagascar is often linked to the El Nino Southern Oscillation, a climate phenomenon in the Pacific Ocean. Wait, stop. A natural phenomenon somewhere in South America has an effect on the outbreak of plague in Madagascar, an island that last time we checked was off the coast of Mozambique. Yes, correct, in Madagascar. There's a tradition to remember the dead every seven years and they actually take the shrouded, so they, they, they wrap their dead in shrouds, lay them to rest, and after seven years they take them back out. They are not in deep graves, they are more in like, a bit like a crypt, um, but above ground. So they take the shrouded uh, dead out and they spend days just singing about their achievements and their lives to remember the dead. Um, it's a really big, traditional, very important festival. Unfortunately, there is evidence that while they do so, they also become infected with the plague, which comes from fleas from the rats that live in the crypts. And since the El Nino Southern Oscillation affects the weather, and the weather affects how many fleas there will be on the rats, El Nino has a clear effect on the likelihood of a plague outbreak in Madagascar. Things are interconnected. There is no black and white. There are many factors affecting things, especially diseases. It's a complex system. During the outbreak itself, you can no longer find Cathy in the field or on a chair under a tree. During an outbreak, she no longer concerns herself with individual cases. At that moment, she remains at ITM in Belgium and mainly wants to be fed with data. Lots and lots of data. So we would like to know... What, what's the climate data? What was the climate data in the last year? How many cases are there? What are the conditions right now? Was there anything special? It's not about dropping everything, going there and seeing a patient. Because actually, the exact symptoms that a patient has is for me not very meaningful. That doesn't, doesn't play a role. What plays a role for me is how do the families react? How does the country react? Um, what is the normal behavior, the day-to-day -day behavior of a person that got infected? In this way, Cathy tries to get a clear picture of how the pathogen reacts in people and how people react to the disease. She says to other researchers and health professionals, give me the pieces of the puzzle. She then tries to put together everything we know and tell us what that picture looks like. For instance, the picture of avian flu. At that moment, the outbreak itself has already started. You can't stop it from causing the first cases. It's already happened. But you can prevent it spreading. With avian influenza, you need to know where the birds are. You need to know where the poultry farms are. You need to know what the regulations in the country are, and so on. And so she tries to answer the question, who's going to be next, for example? What's going to happen next? Whether you are Lawrence, stuck in the mud, Kevin, peering through his microscope, Johan, trying to set up a project, or Kathy, trying to solve the puzzle, it is very difficult to collect answers and puzzle pieces during the chaos of an outbreak. It's crucially important to prepare well in what we call peacetime, and this, this is also for research. Much better to collect your answers in advance so that you know how a disease will behave when it breaks out. Nowadays, we have the solutions to cure a lot of infectious diseases. We often know how the disease is transmitted and how we should stop the outbreak. We sometimes even have vaccines. But there is one giant challenge. We can get all the biomedical proof we want, but if people don't want to take a leap of faith, it's useless. We need to know how people think and react in times of uncertainty. We may already find it difficult just to understand our partners or our best friends at times. So how can we expect to ever understand what drives people from other cultures or people with opposing opinions? That is what we'll figure out in the next episode.
The only thing standing in the way of malaria elimination is really the human factor. There are many, many things that we do every day where we know that is not healthy, but we do it anyway. Thanks for listening. Join us next time and find out the importance of the human factor in combating infectious diseases. For more information on the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, please go to itg.be slash podcast.